On a technical basis for silver bulls like myself, breaking through 26 resistance this week was an important move. Uninitiated normies watching this week's SD Bullion Market Update likely won't understand this. But in the coming years, if they look back at this video, well, they'll likely understand it better by then. It was capped and obvious by Tuesday afternoon that this would end up a good week in our paper performance for Silver Bulls. Later in this week's update, we'll take a look at some longer term charts and past historical analogs to try and glean how long this current run might go before an eventual price pullback and consolidation of the gains. The mostly dumbed down media has thankfully not been pumping gold or silver all that much. Actually, a lot of their thoughts about what's been going on have been misplaced. But while central banks have been buying gold bullion in record size over the last two years, neither the institutional investor class nor the typical media attention required to pump asset classes into mania phase, neither has really arrived yet. Of course, I maintain my long-term view that this eventual coming gold mania ahead is likely going to become the last and final bubble of this post-World War II debt supercycle era. Silver will, of course, tag along for this crazy coming ride, and yeah, it's going to get nuts. More on that in the second half with some sobering data facts of our bullion market update this week. But first, let's take a ride around the world, starting in the east and ending in the west with some decent CNBC media coverage of what is already happening for gold and now even silver bulls. Uh, enough about equity. Let's talk about the commodities. They're also on our radar, more so precious metals, gold and silver, Manisha. Oh, well, yes. Uh, you know, even before I start to tell you on what is happening with gold, if you bought gold Mangalam last year, same time at 55,000, at 70,000 today, you would be sitting on a 15,000 uh, uh, rupees per gram, but 10 grams rather of profit already. Well, we are looking at all-time highs in case of gold. In last 10 days, actually, every single day, we've seen an all-time high come in for gold. We've seen prices gain up by 8% in last one month, and we are up by 10% in this uh, year until now. When the strength comes in because of safe haven buying, the wider conflict that Middle East is looking at right now also has to do with the fact that you're looking at strong buying coming in from institutions, family houses. There is buying also on ETF, <clears throat> pardon me, there's buying also coming in from gold bonds, etc. And that has been supportive. And not just gold, take a look at silver because we've seen 4% of gains overnight into this one. 26 month highs is where silver is trading in right now. The solar industry demand, also the point that this is a fourth year of deficit when it comes to silver, are some of the factors which are supportive. With Street telling us that further highs is what you should anticipate in the second half of this year as well for precious metals. All right. Uh, you know, I've been lucky because I used to sit very close to Manisha earlier and she used to keep telling me that there is no opportune time to buy gold. You should just yeah. keep buying. And Manisha, I've listened to that. So I've enjoyed some of those gains here in the last uh, one year or so. But as I always tell you, I'm buying it for the next 18 to 20 years. So and I hope to make a lot of money and the kids will enjoy it. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Manisha. But, you know, just uh, Nigel went ahead and uh, bought uh, the gold, taking note of Manisha's advice. Never too late to buy gold, Ma Manisha. But at, at, at current levels, what would you think makes more sense? Gold or the more accessible silver? You know what? People are telling us that gold has done its run-up and silver will catch up now. And for the next 6 and 12 months, silver actually could outperform gold. So if you haven't bought gold yet, I think silver is your better bet right now. Of course, that is their current Indian perspective. But if we take the long yearly price chart view of gold on the left and silver on the right-hand side in fiat Indian rupee terms, throughout this full fiat currency era 1970 until now in 2024, well, their take on leaning into silver momentum at the moment certainly makes sense, technically speaking. I mean, gold on the left in Indian rupee terms uh, is gonna continue to go up and to the right, of course, but silver in India is recently breaking out of a powerful cup and handle formation. And it's now having passed its 2011 highs just recently. It's also not any wonder that India has been on a setting record size rush to buy silver bullion inventories to start the first quarter of this year, 2024. Moving over to Japan in fiat yen terms, Japan's about to pass its 2011 high in local silver prices. The fiat yen in gold terms broke out well before the fiat US dollar gold price did, 
So it would be recent rhyming if silver in fiat US dollar terms were to follow suit with the yen in the coming years. On the bigger picture side of the once strong fiat yen versus the US dollar equation, here is the yearly fiat yen versus gold on the left and silver on the right hand side throughout this full fiat currency era again. Gold in fiat Japanese yen is already now nearly two times its 1980 high. But on the right, as I showed you in the chart prior, silver in fiat Japanese yen is just about to pass its 2011 highs. The key point here is silver in fiat Japanese yen terms still has to nearly threefold from now to meet its seemingly ancient 1980s high. Remember, gold leads in bullion bull markets, silver follows, then outperforms. The old 1980s silver high in Japanese terms, gonna get left behind like gold has already done so. Onwards to CNBC in the USA, who had an insightful guest from Pamp Suisse, analyst Nikki Shields. I guess the momentum trade is very evident in gold prices, but I'm curious about the view on silver. It's not yet at a record. Could it get there soon? We think so. Uh, you know, it's certainly lag gold uh, for the most part, but the last few days it has had bit of that catch up play. Um, it's got a lot going for it, right? It fundamentally, it's in a deficit since 2021. And when you think about the fact that US growth is outperforming expectations, we're getting that first sign of, of Chinese growth kind of coming back with those PMIs. And, uh, you know, silver's that, it's a inflation hedge, but it's also a high beta cyclical asset. So it, it, it sort of plays two parts and, and we do think it, it, it can reach for sure, $30 in, in the short term. Nikki, why is it a high beta cyclical asset? What exactly about silver makes it more economically sensitive in that environment? Well, a large part of silver demand is used in, in industrial spaces. And it's what, what is sort of underappreciated is a big part of it is um, driven by the renewable um, energy economy. So it's used across, um, obviously, 5G, but also electric vehicles, uh, solar panels. And, and so it really has a bit of that copper-esque to it. Um, and, and solely isn't just a precious metal. Right? And we think that that is coming, certainly coming back into play. Okay, so is there a way or a world, Nikki, where we start to take a look at prices for silver and use them as that derivative play on things like renewable energy, on infrastructure spending, that sort of thing? Does it become now then a fundamental analysis as well about whether there are industrial uses that will drive the demand? And is that going to be a huge part of the price picture going forward? I think that is the key differentiator between whether we're talking about a $25 to $30 asset or a $30 to $35 plus dollar asset. Um, if, we can, if, the, if global economic growth can maintain some sort of momentum, um, sil silver absolutely cannot perform. And I think the narrative is going to be changed to, to it being a, a, a good proxy for the renewable transition for sure. I mean, I, th I think if you take a step back, um, you know, e each commodity or hard asset will have the, the individual fundamental story. But at the end of the day, you've got growth sort of thawing in China. You've got a G10 rate cutting cycle occurring when inflation is still qu not quite down to target. And I think that narrative, that macro narrative is where you're going to get commodities as a whole sort of pick up and, and you're going to have to cherry pick which one has a sort of sexier fundamental story, and those would be the first to move um, into this sort of this, this regime change where we're going to be having uh, rate cuts into yet still sticky inflation. And Nikki, just a few seconds left here before we let you go. What is your favorite play in metals right now? Still silver. Uh, we, we like gold, but we like silver better. Not to dunk too hard on Nikki's head, but she started this week with the following two tweets stating this. Quote, gold will never go cocoa. Central banks won't allow it. They own too much, over 1.2 billion ounces. That's 10 times annual supply. And if it does, it's not a 0% probability, maybe a 0.1% probability. No one would want to live in that world. Well, that short-sighted take had to be rebuked with historic data and financial history rhymes. I would venture to guess Nikki's probably in her early 40s, late 30s. Maybe she doesn't remember the 1970s. Of course, we covered part of this topic here on our SD Bullion Market Update last week. But these three long-term charts disprove that recency bias take that she tweeted. 
During the 1970s, gold did double cocoa move. The world didn't end. Matter of fact, 1980s were a great decade to grow up in, in many ways. Central banks at that time collectively owned just under one half of the world's total mined gold supply at the time. Here's how much gold dominated central bank global international reserves by the 1980 price high. They accounted for as high as 73% of sovereign savings in gold bullion. Today, even with record size central bank gold buying over the last few years, we're at what, a pathetic 17 to 18% level? Of course, we played a major role in the shrinkage of gold bullion versus other paper IOUs as sovereign savings uh, over suppressed gold values since 1980. Perhaps our most successful export has been the fiat US dollar and the treasury bonds and bills and IOUs that helped fiat financialize the world we find ourselves in today. While gold bullion is breaking out, regardless of the fact the fiat US dollar remains relatively strong still for now, on the other side of this break, we're going to look at some damning historical data and gargantuan net present value promise piles we're not going to be able to keep in real terms, which will certainly bolster bullion values to come. Stick around. Hello, this is James Anderson on behalf of SD Bullion. Smash the like button if you enjoy these bullion market updates. And be sure to visit sdbullion.com forward slash sweepstakes to enter our free 500 ounce silver coin giveaway. Want to win 500 Silver Tree of Life coins from SD Bullion? Enter and you could be the next lucky receiver of a phone call like this. Hello. Hi, Stuart. This is Dr. Tyler Wall, president and founder of SD Bullion. And I'm calling you to let you know that you won the SD Bullion giveaway of a monster box of 2023 Silver Eagles. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got to tell my wife this, because she's not going to believe it. Honey? Yes. Okay, doctor, let her know. Yeah, this is Dr. Tyler Wall. I just let you know that you guys won the Munster Box of 2023 Silver Eagles giveaway from SD Bullion. No way. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> she would never believe me if I told her that. I'm online all day long with your website looking for deals. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, your site's fabulous and your company's fabulous. Well, I appreciate that feedback. And uh, we'll be following up with you shortly on getting your Munster Box shipped to you. Congratulations again. Thank you, doctor. So click the link below because the next big winner could be you. The spot gold price had another record nominal high close in fiat US dollar terms, finishing the week near 2,330 an ounce bid. The spot silver price ramped after clearing 26 early in the week to close trading at 2750 an ounce bid. The spot gold silver ratio shrunk to 84 given silver strength on the week relative to gold. Gold's 200-day moving average is getting close to 2,000 an ounce, adding another plank to the building support of the building nominal price at the moment. Now, if we somehow see 2,400 an ounce gold in this run, we will have reached pretty rarefied air in terms of what's happened maybe a dozen times throughout this full fiat currency era. I'm talking about the spot price ballooning plus 20% above its 200-day moving average. On the silver side of that equation, this recent move could just be starting. Key technical levels to watch next are 28 resistance, which should prove strong. And of course, the tamp down 30 an ounce line that good old Rosti at the CFTC liked to cheerlead. When that finally gets uh, taken out again, pretty impossible to say exactly when, but I can tell you breaking through that resistance at some point ahead, well, that's inevitable. If we go back and look at how gold on the left and silver on the right behaved during the late 1978 breakouts, we can see that $200 an ounce gold acted a bit like 2000 an ounce gold has the last few years. <clears throat> and for a while, 200 an ounce gold then was resistance, then it became support. It fourfolded gold's price after it finally tapped in late 1978 by early 1980. You can see there was a negative 20% fall over November 1978 from 250 an ounce to rebound off the $200 an ounce then price support level. That's a large swing in 30 days. Wild short-term price swings can and do happen during bullion bull markets. Interestingly, at the same time, during the same month, silver basically shrugged it off better than gold and marched on to damn near tenfold in price within 12 to 13 months that followed. Now, if we look at past precedents regarding the spot gold-silver ratio when bullion bull markets broke out, the late 2008 into early 2011 move is interesting to uh, take a look at as well. Then there was a collapse from about 84 to 34. It played out in a time frame of about two and a half years. We're talking about the gold-silver ratio on the bottom half there. This time, we're again up at historical GSR nosebleed mid-80s levels. 
but we're coming off one of the largest pendulum swing highs ever recorded in the spot GSR in history. The spike during the COVID 2020 spike, uh, which reached near 130. Often in financial markets, exacerbated swings one way are eventually followed by exacerbated swings and spike lows in the other direction. So moving on to damning unfunded promise piles called Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid combined. The U.S. Treasury has this forecast of their net present value in terms of costs going out on what they call a, quote, infinite horizon. And by the word infinite, get this, they mean 75 years out from now. Basically, the average lifespan of a young U.S. citizen in the present day. U.S. Treasury had Janet Yellen sign the report, and the number I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with the now nearly $33 trillion in U.S. debt already built through the end of last year, 2023. They stated in net present value terms, the coming 75-year expense of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is $175.3 trillion. Yeah, I know. That's a massive number. It's impossible to even wrap your mind around it. I get it. At the very least, they state in the report right below that number that it can only be satisfied through increased borrowing, higher taxes, reduced program spending, or some combination thereof. Well, I'm going to put my political finger into the wind and guess that younger generations are going to renegotiate and rebuke this unpayable deal they never made as they eventually come into power. Former Fiat Fedhead in 2005 already told us the obvious point regarding Social Security and the underlying future fiat currency payments in question. We don't have a system that's working. We have one that basically moves cash around and we can guarantee cash benefits it's far out and at whatever size you like, but we cannot guarantee their purchasing power. Okay, okay, I know. It's scary, especially for anyone nearing retirement age or having already paid the bulk of their life's work and time into this poorly designed pay-as-you-go supplemental retirement payment system. Remember how last week we looked at the fact that the debt to GDP in the United Kingdom ballooned to nearly 250% right after the Second World War? Well, in the USA here, we're not even at 130% yet. So we got that going for us. Now, since following World War II, the British pound lost over negative 99.5% of its value to gold bullion to date. As our debt to GDP levels keep ballooning this decade, likely into next, what do you think is going to happen to confidence? If the fiat US dollar were to catch up to the losses the fiat British pound has already had versus gold to date, we're looking at a spot gold price of over 8,000 an ounce. Now that, of course, should take a while yet, but time is speeding up. The central banks know this current system is failing. The damning arithmetic and the unfunded promise pals are clownishly unpayable. So what to do? How about further consolidating the banking system and clamping down for more control over payment systems? Last week, SWIFT announced a new CBDC platform launch in the next 12 to 24 months. And this week, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York Bank of France representing the Euro, Bank of Japan, Bank of Korea, Bank of Mexico, Swiss National Bank, and Bank of England and the BIS, they announced Project Agora. They paint this soft launch program as an exploration and tokenization of cross-border payments. What it really means is CBDCs are coming, and now many of the world's largest central banks are admitting so from their respective digital sandboxes. This has been their plan for some time now. Each month, we get closer and closer to the likely crisis, which will be foisted upon us, and then the CBDC system will be introduced to allow their new oncoming payment systems to come into fruition. The Fiat Fed knows it's a hot-button issue and will keep playing possum and coy in public. But it's in the works, and they are telling us point-blank now. I know, it's not the happiest of news to end the week's update on, especially with silver popping out and gold doing so great. And yes, for years now, bullion bulls, it certainly felt like we were a small group of weirdos betting on the inevitable in the dungeon. But as this mania really gets moving in earnest, bullion is going to go mainstream, and nauseatingly so. And as they move to try and further push and prod us into further digital clown worlds of devaluation, promise piles, and currencies galore, at the very least, you should have a prudent position of your net worth privately held outside their collapsing systems. That bullion is going to revalue much, much higher in the coming tumultuous years and even decades coming. That is going to be all for this week's SD Bullion Market Update. As always, to you out there, take great care of yourselves and those you love. 
If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and share it with those you love. Subscribe to our channel and hit that alert button so you know when we publish new bullion market updates.